and joining us now on the debate. In Edmonton, Alberta, Lauren Gunter, columnist with the National Post. In the nation's capital, Susan Riley, columnist of the Ottawa Citizen, and Joël Denis Bellevance, Ottawa Bureau Chief at La Presse. And here in studio, Andrew Coyne, National Editor for McLean's. And let me start by wishing everybody a Happy New Year. Andrew, to you, to our friends in Points Beyond, it's good to see you all. I'm going to, uh, I guess, start this new year with a bit of a lump of coal because I'm going to quote somebody else. None of you four. Here's from the Hill Times, Eric Grenier. While Canadian politics can be unpredictable, there is one thing that has lately been certain to remain the same, polls. The voting intentions of Canadians have been immovable over the last eight months. Averaging out the polling data on a month-to-month -month basis shows two parallel and virtually straight lines for the Conservatives and Liberals stretching back to April. The Tories have maintained the support of about 33 to 35 percent of Canadians since then, while the Liberals are mired at between 27 and 30 percent support. This stagnation equates to a potential quagmire in the House of Commons, as voters appear set to return almost equal numbers of Conservatives and a combination of Liberal and New Democratic MPs to Ottawa in the next election. Okay, let's get into this. Susan, uh, to you first. When you see this kind of stagnation in the polls, that often gets party people wondering whether or not a change at the leader's level might nudge those numbers a little more positively in one direction. And I guess I want to start by finding out how much talk in Ottawa is there of that right now? Very little. Um, I'm not hearing any, and I think it's going to take. I don't think anybody's 100% entirely happy with the leaders that they have. I'm talking about the caucuses right now, but it's going to take some kind of a crisis, I'm afraid, um, to provoke change. Probably another election. I'm in the minority camp. I'm not expecting an election this year. I'm expecting a further drift into irrelevance um, for the whole federal scene. It uh, reminds me of, um, let's say, a hockey game. I mean, at some level, it doesn't matter who wins the game. Um, it matters if is anybody watching hockey anymore and I think we're almost at that state with federal politics. That is a depressing way to put it if that in fact is the <laughs> it's case. My it's my first sports analogy too. I'm quite proud I'm of it. I'm very myself. proud of you. That was really good. <laughs> Andrew, how about it? How much chat do you pick up on whether or not a change of leader of any of the major parties would nudge those polls one way or another? Well, I don't pick up a lot of chat to begin with but uh, no, I agree with Susan. I don't think anybody's uh, going to be changing leaders anytime soon. I also agree with her. I've been predicting a 2012 election for the last two years. Um, we are in a static situation. Never mind going back to April. Go back two years, three years. It's been more or less stuck with a, the occasional bump, you know, last year at the, when uh, after Ignatieff's ill-timed election sortie, the, the Tories went up about five or ten points, but then they lost it again after the prorogation uh, brouhaha. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we are stuck in the mud, and I don't think it's going to change. Lauren Gunter, what are you hearing from uh, the Prime Minister's home province? Well, the Conservatives claim to be very ready for an election, but they're not concerned whether there is one or not. They're, they're quite prepared to wait until conditions change or improve, but I don't think that things are going to change much this year. I'm in the camp, too, where I think we're in late 2011 or, or early 2012 before we're we're into an election and that would be remarkable because it would be almost four years since the last one. So we've had the, the stability in Parliament of a majority government without actually having a majority government. So it, it's quite remarkable. I, I, I can't remember a time when there were so few federal topics that inspired me to write columns or the editorial board at the paper that I work for to, to write editorials about federal politics. We're off, often in the mornings finding it difficult to come up with topics because Ottawa's not generating anything of interest. Hmm. We did in, in Ontario in 1977 to 1981 have four straight years of minority parliament, but of course it's, uh, I, I can't remember if it ever happened before federally if we've ever had four straight years. Well, you had a formal electoral pact in Ontario, which is in this case in, in federal politics yeah. has just been because they've been able to play the opposition parties off against each other. Yeah. Joel Denis, why don't you weigh in on that first question as well? Well, the, f the only thing that I hear about leadership change comes from Quebec City and it could affect the Bloc Québécois if Pauline Marois, the Parti Québécois leader, does not survive uh, her leadership uh, test that she has to submit in April in Quebec City. If she doesn't win enough votes, then that will open the door for Gilles Duceppe and that's the only leadership change that would have. It would affect the separatist party and not the federalist party. So that's an interesting element. It would change dramatically the dynamics if ever Gilles Duceppe goes to Quebec City would probably open the door for more seats for the Conservative Party in outside of Montreal and maybe some seats for the NDP in uh, Montreal uh, itself. So that, what, that's what we, we're watching. And everybody agrees that Mr. Michael Nietzsche will have at least one kick at the can in the next federal election. Uh, Stephen Harper, as you know, is very much in control of his party. 
And uh, Jack Layton, I think, with the kind of uh, uh, year he had, he's also, uh, I think, uh, solidly at the helm of his party. So that's the only chat out here. It's about a leadership party in Quebec City that could affect the Bloc Québécois, but that's it. Okay, since you've done it party by party by party, let's in fact do that right now and go party by party by party. And we're going to start with the Conservatives. And Susan, again, to you first here. How would you characterize the state of Stephen Harper's leadership over the Conservative Party today? Um, I think it's very firm, um, and I don't think it's under any threat whatsoever. And I think, considering the very low bar for leadership that's being set at the federal level, um, he's the, probably the best leader. I mean, he plods dutifully one step after the other, um, mostly in the same direction. Occasionally, he makes a faux pas, sometimes on a large scale. Um, he seems to just kind of sh brush it off and, and continue. Um, there's no open rebellion um, in his ranks, and there isn't even very much dissent, which is astonishing. Um, I think the closest we've come to a public expression of dissent was the departure of Jim Prentice, um, his very talented and ambitious um, environment minister who's now with us, a uh, bank in, in Toronto. Um, that was very telling, although it was all done very politely. Um, but I don't think as long as Mr. Harper retained, first of all, his personality, his, um, his communication skill, um, and the fact that he does retain power all make him, you know, quite unthreatened in his current role. Andrew, he has, despite uh, three elections as leader, one loss, two minority government wins, been unable to win a majority government so far. Yeah. Does that affect his hold on his party? It doesn't, but there's, it's more now out of fear and demoralization than out of any great enthusiasm. Nobody talks about Harper the strategic genius anymore. There have been too many just, you know, cock-ups, frankly. Uh, so you add that to the fact that he's denuded the party of so many of their core beliefs, in fact, gone violently against some of their core beliefs. Uh, so right now, look, he's the sitting prime minister. He has all the instruments of power at his command. People fear him. People are not willing to speak out openly against him. Um, but there are at least rumblings. And over time, if he can't actually win, at some point that's going to become a telling factor for him. I would add to Susan's uh, uh, note about Jim Prentice, Maxime Bernier is not directly challenging the leadership. He's not openly criticizing the government. He's just saying and enunciating policies that are diametrically opposed to the government. Uh, and getting and, away with and it. And getting away with it and getting a following for it. Yeah. And at some point, th those kinds of feelings, for now, are, are everyone's keeping them stowed, but at some point, those will erupt. Lauren, you know, Jeffrey Simpson wrote in the Globe and Mail in June that Harper was actually more, as Andrew just put it, more feared than admired by his caucus. Do you think leaders actually prefer it that way? They may. I don't think that that's the case with, with Harper. I don't think that there's a lot of, you know, enthusiasm and love for him, but I think there is a fair amount of respect for him. But the, the point is that he, uh, after having only won two minorities and having lost his first election, still does not have an open rival. He has no Paul Martin to Jean Chrétien. I mean, this is a man who cannot be that much in control of his caucus that they all fear him that much. They have a grudging respect for him. A lot of them like him. Uh, most of them abide him. Uh, I think most of them like him. But he also benefits from the fact that there are, uh, he's, he's the, the tallest person in a, in a very short forest. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the, there are not an awful lot of competitors within the caucus, and there are not a lot of competitors for his job outside in the other parties either. So he's benefiting very much from the fact that there are no challenges inside or outside to his leadership. Joel Denis, you've, you've heard it said before, there are people who, who okay, Lauren just sent it, give him grudging respect. There are others who think that he is uh, a cold, calculating bully. They go, you know, obviously much tougher. Do you think the Prime Minister wants to change the image that Canadians have of him right now? Well, we saw him singing in front of the Tory caucus <laughs> before Christmas, and that's usually a sign that he wants to have a smoother image with, uh, with Canadians because the cameras were allowed. It was not a private party. It was very much an open party, and Mr. Harper gave quite a show that was quite uh, approved by a lot of people. Um, I agree that Mr. Harper is very much feared by his caucus and, and also very much respected by his, because he's a very bright leader. Uh, you, you know, he can um, resume or, or, you know, put into a few words a very complex issue that can, people can understand. You ask him a questions on any issues and he's got an answer that is, you know, sounds intelligent at least and comprehensible. So that's quite a, for a leader and a, a, of his capacity, that's quite impressive. Also, I think people should not forget the fact that he brought the conservative back to power. He took the party that was, you know, the alliance that was going nowhere 
brought it uh, together with the Conservative Party, the Progressive Conservative Party, won the leadership, fought a campaign, lost it, fought another campaign in 2006 and won it, and then won in 2008. So uh, people in the Conservative base have a lot of respect for what he did for the Conservative Party and the Conservative movement, although over the past few months, you know, he has gone away a bit, or drifted away from the core beliefs of the Conservative Party, but that should be uh, brought back, uh, be brought back to uh, the core beliefs of the Conservative in the next budget that we will see. I wonder if uh, I have to let Andrew re revisit his previous comment, because on uh, all of what Jules Denis says is absolutely accurate. This is a guy who, despite getting criticized a lot, you know, has has he's been the guy for six years at the helm of his party and he was at the helm of another party before that and did his, some historic things getting them back together mm -hmm. uh... you gotta give him his due at some point i don't do you? and I, look i was talking him up when everyone else was, was writing him off he's an enormously impressive guy and particularly in an interview or a, or a you know debate setting he's very quick on his feet he has got them this far but i should say he's got them this far and then they've stalled they are at thirty something odd percentage points if you go back in the early days of the Canadian Alliance, when Stockwell Day was the leader, they were at 30% plus. So he has, he has not succeeded in expanding the base, notwithstanding having you know, denuded the party of all of their beliefs in pursuit of the center ground, he hasn't actually won the center ground because the style of his government, the tone of his government is so off-putting to people. I'm struck well, when you look at the polling data, you know, this, the, this one last point is when ECOS does polls, they ask these two questions. One is, is the country on the right track? A standard pollster question. Mm -hmm. Usually, and, and they get a solid majority saying yes. Usually that trans, translates into great support for the governing party. But when they ask people, is the government on the right track, they say no. So mm -hmm. there's something about the style of this government, the, the, the extreme partisanship, the cold tone that really puts people off. Mm -hmm. Susan? I was just going to say, not only has he not expanded his base, he seems to be cultivating enemies. He seems to think, oh, the census. I mean, this was not an issue, the long-term census. Uh, let's make it an issue. Let's go after educated people and all the academics and the various people who support and needed the uh, mandatory long-term census. I mean, that's just one example. I don't think he's going to change in answer to your question. However, Nigel Wright, um, this bright boy from Bay Street, has now come in to, as his chief of staff starting, I think, this week. Uh -huh. um, and by all accounts, although he's a longtime conservative, Andrew probably knows him better than, than I do, but he's apparently not as uh, viciously partisan or personal in his politics. Um, whether this brings a change, I think if it does bring a change, if he's able to um, mitigate uh, Mr. Harper's uh, worst instincts, then it, it, the Conservatives could start to see gains in the polls. Okay, Andrew if referred a moment Steve ago. Yeah. Sorry, Joe, I yeah. want to make sure we get a chance to get all the parties covered here. So let me move on to the Liberals at this stage. Yeah. Yeah. Because conventional, and in fact, uh, Joel Denis, why don't we start with you. Conventional wisdom holds that Michael Ignatieff is the least secure of all the federal leaders at the moment. And I want to know whether you, th I don't mean that in a personal sense, I mean in terms of his hold on the job. <laughs> I heard Andrew snickering here and I, I just want to clarify what I meant by that. How accurate, in fact, do you think that is? Well, we always say that the leader of the opposition is the toughest job in Canada. And I think we, I agree with that because you have to criticize the government for what it does and you have also to put forth policies that will convince Canadians to come on board and support you during elections. And we know that Michael Nietzsche had a rough year in 2009, but 2010 I think was uh, better. I think we saw some improvement. Uh, his grasp of policies is better. Uh, he looks more comfortable in his shoes during question periods during the fall. He would not read his questions, but at, stand up on his feet and ask his questions directly to the Prime Minister. And he was good at coming back at any attack that the Prime Minister was launching at him. So I think he's learning on the job, but he may not have enough time to be you know, at the point where he should be to be able to be very competitive with the Prime Minister, uh, Stephen Hopper, in the next federal elections. But saying all that, uh, I think, like I said earlier, uh, Mr. Ignatieff will have at least one kick at the can. The Liberals are all year that, that they don't have any money anyway to hold a leadership race. And they've seen a bit of improvement in the part of the Mr. Ignatieff. And also, Mr. Ignatieff, with the summit tour, allow the Liberal Party to find uh, its own identity, finally, to distinguish itself from the Conservative Party. Now, let me pick and up on that. Why. Let me pick up on that with Andrew. You know, he did have this summer bus, bus tour that was very well reported on, very well regarded. He's doing this thing now, open mic, you know, where he does the, you know, interacting with ordinary Canadians. He says, quite in distinction to the Prime Minister, who never meets any real Canadians, only party supporters. How effective do you think all of that's been? Well, the optics are certainly great. Uh, it, it shows him on his feet, answering questions, as you say, working hard for the vote, which voters always like, but I think particularly for any leader of the Liberal Party, and particularly for this leader of the Liberal Party, you can't have any whiff of entitlement around. You really have to be shown to be rolling up your sleeves and working for the vote. 
I think it was very good for him personally in terms of working on his uh, ability to kind of speak clearly about what exactly is his beef with this present government. And you could see him. I followed him around for a few days. You could see him. It's almost like a, like a stand-up comic working on his act in the boonies before he comes into the, to the big show. Um, but all that being said, it hasn't registered so far in the polls at all. Uh, the polling data still shows he trails way behind the other leaders in, in terms of popular perceptions of him. So at, at this point, you would say it hasn't paid off. The only caveat I put on that is sometimes in politics you see kind of perceptions are kind of planted deep that don't show up right away because mm -hmm. people aren't really paying attention. But what, what they can sometimes do is when the, when the bell goes off for the election campaign, people go, you know, actually, I, I, I've been kind of thinking I don't feel so badly about him anymore. So that's the sliver of hope, as, as slim as it is for the liberals, is that maybe once people really start focusing in, they'll realize that, as, as Joel Denis was saying, he certainly has improved his game. Lauren, he started his career as the liberal leader by saying nice things about the oil sands. He has really tried hard, I think many would, would observe, to make the Liberal Party a, a, a more palatable option in Alberta. How's it working? I think he's a complete non-factor here, frankly. I mean, I don't think mm -hmm. that he's detested the way Trudeau was, the way Mulroney became. I mean, I think it's forgotten lots of times that Mulroney became almost as unpopular in Alberta as Trudeau had been. Uh, Michael Ignatieff just doesn't register. He do, he's not in the conversations. No one mentions him. Uh, you know, it, it, he said some nice things in a speech in, in Gastown in Vancouver in, in early 2009 about the oil sands being the engine of the Canadian economy, which made a lot of people here somewhat relieved. But then last year he made some environmental noise that made it sound as though there were going to have to be big changes made in the oil sands. So people, to the extent they think about him, aren't sure what to do with him yet. But he's a very bright man, and I think he suffers not from a lack of ability in retail politics. I mean, I think all of our leaders at this point, with the possible exception of Mr. Duceppe, have a problem with retail politics. They're not good at shaking hands and kissing babies. They don't seem to like it, and they're not particularly charismatic. What Ignatieff has beyond that, I think, is his bigger problem, is I, I don't think you could put a sheet of paper between him and the prime minister on most mm -hmm. issues. Uh, you know, on, on foreign policy, on defense issues, on all sorts of economic things. I mean, the liberals claim that they would have spent more on, on, on uh, stimulus, but they would have had smaller deficits. I mean, all of this is a real mishmash that, the, that he's inherited from a liberal party that doesn't know where it's going, and he's never really been able to get his hands on it, mold the clay of the party, and show how it's different from the conservatives. Susan, before I get you to weigh in, I want to read something that Aaron Wary in McLean's uh, wrote uh, just a couple of days ago, and here's how it goes. Mr. Ignati have officially surpassed Stéphane Dion in tenure as leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition last month. He has now served 755 days, just more than two years, in the thankless job. For the sake of a comparison, Stephen Harper spent 1,286 days, three and a half years, as opposition leader before becoming prime minister, while Jean Chrétien served 1,039 days, a little more than two years and ten months. Wilfred Laurier and Robert Borden went more than nine and ten years, respectively, before becoming Prime Minister. Which begs the question whether or not all of you ink-stained wretches are writing Ignatieff off too quickly. <laughs> Susan. Well, not quickly enough, in my humble opinion. I think, you know, there's a contradiction about him. You know, he's, he's, if he was parachuted into the Prime Minister's chair tomorrow, um, I think he would make a perfectly plausible prime minister. In fact, he fits the mold of a successful Canadian prime minister. He's on the center right. He would be managerial and unexciting. He's presentable, you know, physically presentable, and he's uh, fluently bilingual. I mean, he wouldn't. There be and he's bright. There'd be no surprises. Um, but he's not been parachuted in. He has to earn the job. And I was just thinking this the other day. For a man who spent his entire life in the world of ideas, you know, from from university to Harvard to the BBC to. Um, to journalism, um, he doesn't bring any ideas with him. He does not appear to have brought any passions. He's got notions, he's got observations, like, you know, we ink-stained wretches do, but he doesn't really seem to be animated by any passion. And I think that's a huge deficit, and I think people notice that, and I think that's why, as Lauren says, he's invisible to a lot of voters. Okay, they don't I know think, what think, he cares about. I think there's a lot of truth in what Susan was saying, but I would also, just to come back to your point, I always remind people, three months before Stephen Harper won the 2006 election, there was a flourishing mm -hmm. dump Harper movement within the Conservative Party. Mm -hmm. Three months before Jean Chrétien 
uh, won the 1993 election, he was having to stow the nervous Nellies, quote unquote, in his own party who were convinced that Kim Campbell was going to mop the floor with them. Mm -hmm. So it is, uh, it is a thankless job, it is a tough job, and oftentimes people are underestimated in it. Joel Denis, tell me the buzz in Ottawa in terms of, I know people right now are keeping a scorecard, and they're saying if Mr. Ignatieff does not fill in the blank in the next election, then he can't keep his job. What's in that blank? Well, he's got to at least win uh, a minority government. That's the test for the Liberals. You know, they, they're used to being in power, and they've been out of power for uh, five years now, and they find it very difficult to be out of power. And they're not used to it. The, the last century belonged to the, the Liberal Party, and they want the 21st century to belong to the Liberal Party as well. But I think it's going to be the Conservative Party. So century. it's not good enough, Joel Denis, for him to no. say make Mr. Harper's government smaller. He's got to win. He's got to win. I think he's got to win. That's the test. I think the problem for uh, Michael Nyatsev, if I may say, when he came to uh, be the leader of the Liberal Party, is that he was suffering from the same syndrome as Paul Martin, trying to please everyone all the time. And that way you, you, know, you, you blur the lines, you don't know what you stand for and what you want to do with your party and with, uh, the, if you would form the government. I think he got rid of that. Now he's more into a Jean Chrétien uh, mold. Uh, you know, I'll give you a few examples. He wants to cancel the contract to buy new airplanes. Uh, Chrétien promised that as well in the 1993 election campaign to get rid of the contract that to purchase new helicopters. You know, it's still a problem today, but you know. Uh, <laughs> he wants to cancel the tax cuts for big corporations that uh, came into effect in uh, January 1st. So that's a big wedge, wedge issue. That will probably bring a lot of voters to think about twice how they should vote when Mr. Uh, Ignatieff presents that case to uh, voters in the next elections. So those are two big issues that separate the Liberals and the Tories. And he wants to bring in a pharmacare program uh, that, you know, to help uh, people who uh, have relatives suffering from disease or, uh, uh, you know, can be cured. So that's another issue that, you know, bring him on the social side. Of, well, let me of, go with Lauren again one more time then. Lauren, you said just a few moments ago that you didn't see much as a, what was it, a sheet of papers difference in most policies between Ignatieff and Harper. And there's four, I mean, F-35s, corporate taxes, <clears throat> home care, pharma care, they're pretty different on those four policies, and those are four pretty big policies, wouldn't you say? No, I think they're fairly small policies, actually. Hmm. I mean, pharma care, home care, you know, most people aren't thinking of that as a, as a defining issue of our time. Uh, Afghanistan might have been, but the Liberals basically sided with the Tories on the extension in a non-combat role from 2011 to 2014. So I don't think in most people's minds, it, to the extent that they're paying attention to federal politics right now, that there's much distinction between the two. I mean, most people know we don't have enough money for a big-scale social program, new big-scale social programs. So I, I don't suppose they pay much attention when, when Ignatieff says pharmacare, because they don't think it's going to pay for all of the drugs that they need. So again, I think he has found minor differences between his party and the governing Tories, but not big enough that he's going to sway, say, a million, a million and a half voters in, in Ontario, which is what he would need to do in order to take over government. Okay, we've done Stephen Harper, we've done Michael Ignatieff, let's move on to the third place party now, uh, third place national party, let me put it that way, and that is uh, the New Democrats. Uh, Andrew, to you first. Uh, we all know Jack Layton's had other things on his mind this past year. He's fighting prostate cancer. By all accounts, seems to be doing okay in that fight. Politically speaking, how's he doing? Uh, mixed. It really depends on which poll you look at. Sometimes, and we tend to hyperventilate, of course, over every week's poll. So some polls show them, you know, polling within hailing range of the Liberals, and then people start writing excited pieces about how the NDP are about to overtake the Liberals. Then the next week's poll shows them down close to the Green Party, because every now and then the Green Party shows well in the polls. Um, I think if you take the longer view, there's no doubt that under his leadership, the NDP have come back a long way from where they were under previous leaders. Um, they have, I think, long-term challenges at the same time. They have a real divide between their, you know, downtown urban type of vote and their historical uh, ur you know, rural vote uh, that is very increasingly, I think, hard for them, particularly on environmental issues, hard for them to square. But I think most people would say, well, again, if you look at his personal numbers, he scores very well, uh, as strong or stronger than the Prime Minister on some measures. Um, and I don't think he's in any danger at all. I think the only issue for him will be uh, his health and how long he wants to continue doing this. Susan, he's had the job for seven years, which is a long run for a party leader. He mm -hmm. has good respect in his party. He has a good respect among a certain chunk of the Canadian people. What is your sense, though, of how much longer he wants to do this job? 
I don't really know. <clears throat> However, he does have a granddaughter, the new granddaughter that he talks about a lot. <laughs> and, you know, he's, what, 60-something, I think, eh, Joel? Um, I mean, it's, it's an exhausting, demanding job, uh, health questions aside. Um, so I honestly don't know the answer to that. I think the NDP would do well with new blood, though, not to disparage uh, the advances that Mr. Layton uh, has made. I think the most uh, reasonable and fairest criticism of Mr. Layton is that there's no surprises. I mean, he never surprises. He, he has a sort of a, you know, you talk about the prime minister, uh, speaking notes. I mean, talking points. He has talking points, and you know they're, they're the same ones. You can you can almost write the script before he opens his mouth. I think the other mistake that he's made, um, and it's hurt the party and will hurt it more in the future, is by alienating green voters. I mean, Jack Layton came to that job, and he came from municipal politics in Toronto with a very strong reputation as a, first of all a conciliator, and second of all as a green innovator. And they have basically squandered that by opposing the carbon tax um, in British Columbia, notably, and just recently by calling for um, uh, a reduction in the tax on home heating oil. I mean, this was intended to help seniors and other people on fixed incomes, but essentially what it does is it, you know, it, conti it, it continues the pro our profligate use of fossil fuels. I mean, it's a contradictory position. So I think environmentalists are way less likely to, f to go to his party now, and it, so everything depends on how well um, the Greens do. Well, consistent with our efforts not to quote any of you on this program, I'm now going to quote from Lawrence Martin from the Globe and Mail. We have these people on the show. <laughs> well, you guys get to talk, so we quote others. Here's what Lawrence Martin says about that. We talked about the fact that Stephen Harper's leadership appears to be, you know, there's no Paul Martin on the horizon. Uh, maybe not quite the same thing for the Liberals. There's definitely somebody out there in the wings for the NDP, and here's how Lawrence Martin described that. The NDP has always looked for someone who could build the party in Quebec. It's never worked, and it might not work this time. But at no juncture has the party had as powerful a figure in the province as the volcanic Thomas Mulcair, the lava-tongued lawyer who served in Quebec's <laughs> National Assembly for 13 years as a liberal. Few made stronger impressions than him on Parliament Hill in 2010. Mr. Mulcair has an ego the size of Mount Kilimanjaro with talent <laughs> and temper of almost the same magnitude. He is considered a good bet to become leader of his party. That's pretty well written, actually, Lawrence. Nicely done. Joel Denis. Do you agree that he's the heir apparent? Oh, absolutely, uh, Steve. And I would say, you know, if you look at the Liberals and the Tories, they have nobody you know, that could take the party uh, hands down uh, next morning if the leader resigns. So the NDP is the only party that has a future leader that is, you know, uh, you know, getting good reviews in, in Thomas Mulcair. And you should note, uh, Steve, that we've had a few polls in Quebec recently that show that the NDP is a consistently at at least 20 percent in the poll. So that means that the NDP could pick up one or two more seats in Quebec for the first time in its history. And with Thomas Mulcair at the helm of that party in the next election, the, after the, the, the coming one, uh, the, the NDP could do some damage to other parties in Quebec. It should be uh, noted that Mr. Mulcair is very well viewed, uh, very savvy politicians. He knows how to uh, give a good quote to reporters that will be uh, reported everywhere. And he's a very effective uh, media guy. Okay, and except that. The NDP might, might except need. Except, the except that. You, like you say he's very well viewed, except by the guy who's sitting across the table from me here. <laughs> well, it's nothing to do with me, but, but he's, he's, uh, he's not, much more importantly, he's not well liked in the caucus at all. That's right. And I understand he's That's got right. essentially zero support in caucus to the extent that that yeah. matters. Uh, he's in trouble in his own riding, I understand, as well. So that's, you know, the savior in Quebec is going to have some issues uh, in Outremont. But I think... Uh, I, 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 and nor does he have the collaborative may, style. If of I may disagree exactly. with Andrew right away, I don't think he's in trouble in his riding. I think uh, Martin Cochon, the liberal candidate, will have a very hard time winning that riding away from the NDP. We it's shall see. You, you yeah. may be right. We shall see. Uh, the other point I'd make is I would keep my eye on Paul Dewar. I think Paul Dewar uh, is, yeah. is an extremely impressive individual. He also fits more with certainly the, where the people around Leighton have been trying to take the party. I mean, the liberal weakness has caused both the Conservatives and the NDP to see their opportunity to kind of move into the center. And the NDP under Leighton, and to, much to Susan's dismay on some of these issues, has been trying to move into the center. Dewar, I think, has much more capacity to reach out and appeal to uh, soft liberal voters than I think Mulcair would. Uh, a view for, of the New Democrats from Western Canada, please, Lauren. Well, you know, I think of, of the four uh, leaders in Parliament, Jack Layton would be the most engaging one to have dinner with. 
Uh, and I think that comes across. But he has tried to take over the same turf that now the Liberals and the Tories are are also fighting over, and that doesn't leave his party much distinction either. I, mean, I, I, I think most Canadian voters, if you stopped them while they were out cutting the lawn or shoveling snow and asked them where the NDP differed from the Liberals and the Tories, would have difficulty bringing up uh, one issue other than Afghanistan because there isn't that much to distinguish them. I, with uh, Mulcair, I mean, he, he is more fiery. I think he would be noticed more. Uh, but, and I think he would displace the Tories and the Liberals in Quebec much more effectively than, than anyone else the, the NDP would bring forward. But I don't see him getting a lot of traction, again, beyond where the NDP is now very solid, which is downtown Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal, and uh, Vancouver. Okay, in our, he, in our last five minutes here, in Saskatchewan. In our last five minutes here, let's finish up with the guy who is unassailably the most secure, and I mean, don't mean that in a personality sense, but in terms of, <laughs> he can have this job as long as he wants to, and that's Gilles Duceppe. Uh, Gilles Denis, starting with you, why has this man's hold on that job been as unassailable as it has been for so long? What's his secret? Everybody says that Stephen Harper is a control freak. Well, I think you, we should know that Gilles Duceppe is probably worse than Stephen Harper on that front. An MP cannot give an interview to me or any other media outlet without uh, Gilles Duceppe's office knowing about it and approving about it. So if we, in terms of control freak, I think uh, Gilles Duceppe wins the gold medal. He's been, uh, you know, holding his job quite well because he knows, he masters his files very well. He's a great debater, and also he's got something that uh, no other leader has done in Quebec, that is to tour Quebec every year in August, every corner of the province, meet everyone, feels their concerns, and then brings them to the House of Commons. So every time he asks questions on such and such issue, it's because he's heard it in uh, the community during his summer tour. He does that every year, and I think it's brought him a lot of success. But what's remarkable about him is that he totally lacks warmth. He's the iciest figure I can imagine. Um, he's somewhat like the Prime Minister in that regard. I agree with uh, Jules Denis. I think his uh, strength rests on his mastery of the federal files, and he's, he's just very articulate and smooth. Um, but, you know, you think about people like René Lévesque or uh, Lucien Bouchard or, or uh, people who Quebecers felt affection for. Unless I'm wrong, they don't feel that affection for Mr. Duceppe. They feel that he's a very competent guy and that is reflected in the polls, but mm -hmm. nobody can be as charismatic as Lucien Bouchard or mm -hmm. René Lévesque. I think it comes in one I was going to say, those are pretty big shoes to yeah. fill. Yeah. Andrew, tell me this though, you know, on my trips to Ottawa, I talk to people about Gilles Duceppe and they say that he almost has a kind of, because he's been around for so long and he's participated in what, I think, you know, 11 leaders debates or something like this during election campaigns. He's almost a kind of a senior statesman on the Hill now, even though he's a separatist. <laughs> now, I hear that from people. I'm serious. And he has good relationships on all sides of the House. Sure. Well, he's a capable performer. He's been around forever, so he has that familiarity factor. But let's be frank, he's got the easiest job in Canadian politics, too. He doesn't have to win. Uh, he doesn't have to present any policies or follow through on them. He doesn't have to weigh or balance off one region's concerns against another. He's got 85% of his, of his campaign finance paid for by the Canadian taxpayer. Uh, so, the, you know, he can stay there for as long as he wants to. The only question, as Joel Denis said off the top of the show, is does he want to and can he go back and, and take over Pauline Marois's job at the head of the PQ? If so, all the, all the things change because, and this will be the interesting test, is how much of that Bloc Québécois support, which remains rock solid, election in, election out, how much of that is now attached to his leadership and how much of it is the Bloc? And we'll only find that out if and when he goes. What's your hunch on that, Joel Denis? Well, if je, Pauline Marois doesn't get the support she needs, the door will be wide open. But Gilles Seppe has made it clear that if the next time the, the position is open, he wants the uh, Parti Québécois to roll out the red carpet for him because the last time he was humiliated uh, for 24 hours, he was running and then came back his uh, tails between his legs and <laughs> asking for his job back here in Ottawa. So he would be... And it, it might be a tough fit for him with the Parti Québécois because it's a very authoritarian leader. Mm -hmm. And the Parti Québécois doesn't like to be, uh, and members don't like to be told by its leader to how to behave all the time. Mm -hmm. And that could be, bring some frictions. But like Andrew said, he's got the easiest job. All he has to do is criticize, ask for more money in Ottawa, and if he doesn't get it, well, he gets applause in Quebec. So that's a very easy job. You know, I, I wonder, could though, probably do it as well. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask Lauren. The first candidate. <laughs> Let me ask Lauren this, though. You know, I wonder if the bar really is that low. I, mean, I think it was a John Crenshaw's third election in the year 2000 where 
where uh, the, the P BQ actually lost some seats and Chrétien managed to come back and win some of those seats in Quebec that, that had not been his previously. I mean, he does have to learn when, he's got to win 45 or 40 seats at least, doesn't he, in order to, in order to be seen as, as Mr. Quebec, isn't that a fair statement? He, he does, but, but Duceppe is very, very smart about realizing he doesn't have to say anything that's unpopular in Quebec. All he has to say are po things that are popular among uh, Francophones in Quebec, and, and he'll win 40 or 45 seats. He doesn't have to say things that, that appeal to uh, Western uh, regionalists and to central, uh, to Ontarians, you know, uh, sort of the inertia and conservatism that's natural in Ontario, and then also out to Atlantic Canada and maybe pick up a few seats. He doesn't have to build any coalitions. He simply has to wait until there's a consensus that develops around an issue in Quebec and then jump on top of it and be the, the, the its spokesman in, in Ottawa. He does, he's never going to have to be responsible for government. Why would he want to come back and become Premier of Quebec and, and take up the cause of, of running a government when he can, as Andrew said, not have to fundraise, not have to take any, uh, make any decisions of a, of a, of a governance nature, and, and he just has to find whatever the populist sentiment is in well, Quebec and, the answer and ride that the is, The answer to that is some guys want to be the decider. And Laura, guess, uh, but <laughs> uh, Andrew, no, tell he me, could this, decide he doesn't want to be a decider. He may decide that. Uh, last 30 <laughs> seconds here. Do you see any prospect of any of these party leaders breaking the public opinion deadlock that we've been talking about so far? Uh, if you said today, no. Uh, the only th I think the wild card is Duceppe in Quebec. I think that's the that, that's the what a lot of the parties are looking at is if he goes. And I, this is not a good scenario because if he goes at this point, the polls would show he'd sweep Quebec. The Quebec Liberal Party would be destroyed, and then we'd be back into. Uh, the separatist question again. Ah, oh, the dominoes, they play out. Uh, can I thank all of our guests for coming on the program today? Lauren Gunter from the National Post out in Edmonton. Good to see you again, sir. Susan Riley, Ottawa citizen. Joel Denis Bellevance from La Presse in our nation's capital. And Andrew Coyne from McLean's here in Toronto. Thanks so much, everybody.